Okay, um, let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your spirit once again into our midst as we uh, look at the crisis ahead and the things that we need to know to be prepared and to prepare others. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts and um, may we represent you in all we do. Thank you for the Sabbath and for each person. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, I enjoyed uh, that study there, Dwight. And uh, not from an entertainment point of view, but from a spiritual blessing point of view. So lots that I've learned. Amen. Okay, so um, so we've been looking at this book by uh, Robert W. Olson. And and uh, this is uh, the message, the question, as the message, message now swells to a loud cry, what will be the result? So we know that uh, Ellen White says that the third angel's message, it arrived October 22nd, 1844. So we're under the proclamation of the third angel's message. And that it would be joined by the angel of Revelation 18, which is the second angel's message being repeated with additional aspects to it. One is because of the greater apostasy of Protestantism. So Babylon has fallen. And the message that we are to give as Seventh-day Adventists is a message to those who are in Babylon to come out of her. Now, we know, of course, the Millerites proclaimed come out of her, my people, in Millerite history under the second angel's message. Though that was really the message of Revelation 18. So they didn't really understand that. They just looked at it as the same message. And it is. It's the second angel's message. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Right? That's Revelation 14. But in Revelation 18, it also adds the call to come out of her. So so this message of the loud cry is a message to come out of Babylon, correct? Amen. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So in Millerite history, we have the midnight cry. And what was the midnight cry? To give the warning that the bridegroom is coming. Yeah. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Right. Because that's from the parable of the ten virgins. So if we have the loud cry in our history, um, obviously, the parable of the ten virgins is to be repeated to the very letter, right, or has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter in our history, right? Um, but but Ellen White parallels the loud cry with the midnight cry, right? So she says the loud cry is like the midnight cry. They're, they're, they're a parallel to each other. So, so we need to keep that in mind. Now, we had looked at this uh, – we see standard after standard was left to trail in the dust as company after company from the Lord's army joined the foe and tribe after tribe from the ranks of the enemy united with the commandment keeping people of God, right? So we can see in this loud cry that many people are going to come into Adventism, right? They're going to listen to the message that Seventh-day Adventists are proclaiming. Now, we know that the loud cry is also because when the second angel joins the third angel, the third angel is a message regarding the mark of the beast, right? And receiving, uh, you know, the, the image of the beast, right? So the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the proclamation of the Sabbath, right? So in practical terms, when we're calling people out of Babylon, we're calling them to observe the true Sabbath, now, what is the true Sabbath? It's a trick question. So what's the true Sabbath? So I'm asking you a trick question, and I'm not going to answer it. So somebody has to answer it. I'm, a, I'm on by it and say the Sabbath. It's, it's Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Okay. So A.T. Jones wrote a book called The Jewish Sabbath, uh, The Christian Sabbath, and The Sabbath of the Lord. So in the, in the context of that, if if we're just keeping sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, it, does that mean we're keeping the Sabbath? You know, we're not working. No, we're not. Right? No, we're not. So, right. 
because only a holy person can keep the Sabbath holy. The Sabbath is uh, deals with a complete transformation of character. That is, men rest from their own works as God did from his. So we have to cease from our own works before we can truly keep the Sabbath. So not just secular work, we have to cease from our own unrighteousness because all of our works are filthy rags. All of our righteousness is filthy rags. So, so Christ's righteousness needs to come forth. So we know that Ellen White connects the loud cry of the mighty angel of Revelation 18 with uh, the, the third angel's message, which he says is righteousness by faith in verity, that is in reality, in actuality, lived out in the life. So the reason why people are going to be filling the ranks after company after company leaves, tribe after tribe, from the ranks of the enemy are going to be united with the commandment to keeping people of God, is because there has been a transformation made to God's people. Right, so this, this next statement, the numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. The careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly uh, plead and agonize for it did not obtain it. And they were left behind in darkness. And their places were immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks. Right, so... So we can see that there's all these people going to be coming in. Um, but it's not going to be because we have uh, perfected how to do evangelistic series. Right. There is there are events that are going to occur that are going to demonstrate two classes of worshipers. Uh, the Lord has faithful servants who in the shaking, testing time will be disclosed to view. So what does it mean to be disclosed? Okay, what's something that's closed? If something's closed to view, it can't be seen. So if it's disclosed, what does that mean? It means it, it, means it, it comes open. Yeah, so something that was once closed is going to be now seen. And that is going to be the faithful servants, right? They're going to now be seen, okay? So are God's faithful servants now seen? If they are going to be disclosed, that means they're now closed, right? They're closed to view. So I know nobody answered it, but it should be evident that, that God has faithful servants who are not now seen, and they will be seen. There are precious ones now hidden who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So when we look at the situation in this world, it looks pretty hopeless, right? You know, Elijah says, you know, I only am left, but there's 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. So can we trust that God is doing a work that is now unseen in this world? And even what he's doing in us is right now unseen, right? I mean, we, we obviously know he's doing a work. You know. Yeah. But, but we have to believe that that work is happening 7,000 times more than what we see. Correct? That's right. Okay. They have not had the light which has been shining in a concentrated blaze upon you. But it may be under a rough and uninviting exterior, the pure brightness of a genuine Christian character will be revealed. In the daytime, we look toward heaven, but we do not see the stars. They are there, fixed in the firmament but the eye cannot distinguish them. In the night, we behold their genuine luster. Now, so we see that, why are these people hidden, according to this statement? I don't know, Theodore, but I know this. I know I ain't nowhere near it. Okay, well, it's a rough and uninviting exterior that hides them, right? But there is a genuine Christian character that God is developing in these people. And, and we can be thankful of that because I would say, at least I can say for myself, I have a rough and uninviting exterior, right? You know, we're not we're not of the world, right? We 
were not recognized. But that's because what really matters is, is a true Christian character. So we know that many, many people are going to uh, uh, stand out who God has been working upon. But also, there's going to be many who uh, God is going to call and draw into his truth that that are that are hidden. So so there's there's faithful servants and there are precious ones um, that that God is is going to call. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. So what are these agencies that are combined against the truth? What, what, what kind of agencies are these? Well, it's not to say one is the mainline church to a great extent. Then we've got the okay, so, we've got the New World Order, the wokeism, it's just on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's tons of agencies. There's uh, the media, there's churches, there's Christians, you know, all around us, there are people who are, and, and, and this statement here, this is from Great Controversy, page 212. Now, it's, it's, there's actually an earlier, I'm going to read a little bit of this here. Uh, the great work of the gospel is not to close. So this is from 6, 611, uh, just the last paragraph. I guess it's technically, yeah, the last paragraph. Um, the great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. So one of these things we can see that there is prophecies that were fulfilled, that these pro prophecies are fulfilled again. Right. So that is a parallel. Right. We can see that there's a parallel between these histories. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward when he said, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Acts 3 verse 19 and 20. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. The signs and wonders will follow the believers. Uh, Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of man. That's Revelation 13, 13. Thus, the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. The message will be carried not so much by argument, as by the deep conviction of the spirit of God, the arguments have been presented. The seed has been sown and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence. Yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness. And the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. So this is the, the quote from the spirit of prophecy that most impressed me back in the upper room Bible studies um, that, that helped me see that the work that was going to be done in the last days was of a different nature than the work that the church is doing presently. That this isn't about, you know, some better evangelistic plans or, you know, it's not going to be marketing. It's not going to be advertising. Now, you can see that there is an important for all of this other work that has happened before, right? So the missionary work, uh, the literature that's been distributed, it's been doing its work, right? There's seed that has been planted. But when it comes to this harvest, it, it's, I mean, if the seed hadn't been planted, the harvest couldn't occur, right? It, it, we kind of know that right? from 
if we've ever been involved no. in agriculture. No seed, no harvest. No, no seed, harvest, no harvest, no, right? No seed, no harvest, no rain, no growth. Yeah. So all these things have been important. You know, God raised up a church, and, and that message has gone out. The books have gone out. The literature has gone out. And, and you know, and even with this movement, the message is there on the Internet. These messages have gone out. And people are studying these they, things they would never that aren't grow. connected to us. What's that? Or like that little song, uh, I know a secret that only little flowers know. If it never rained, we would never grow. I've never heard that one. Oh, yeah, that's one from my CUC days, I guess. <laughs> okay. So so we can see that that there is all these agencies, satanic agencies, that have combined, right? They have come become united against the truth. But there is going to be a harvest, right? And that happens under the loud cry. Um, so we have another section here. Before rulers and kings, by what means has God at times brought the gospel to the attention of the great men of earth? Now, he's going to give us here a number of Bible verses. And... So we got Matthew 10, verse 17, and where is it here? 17 to 20. Uh, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. They will scourge you in their synagogues, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. Um, so what is it that's going to cause these great men of the earth to have their attention drawn to the gospel? I mean, we got Mark 13 as well, uh, verses 9 to 11. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils. It's basically the same uh, statement uh, in Mark, in Acts chapter 5. Verse 11, and great fear came upon all the church and as many as, and upon as many as had heard these things. Uh, no, it's not the right one. It's Acts 21. Okay, I looked at 11. And when they heard it, they that entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to prison to have them brought. Um. And in verse 27, and when they had brought them, they sent them, set, set them before the council and the high priest asked them. Right. Um, and then 25, 22. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. So what is it? Why is it? Why is it that Pete, the gospel is going to be brought to the attention of these men? It doesn't really explicitly say this in any of these statements in even Philippians. If, if we think about in the in the time of Darius, uh, the enemies of Israel are going to come and complain about them building the temple, and that's going to draw Darius's attention to the Israelites, where he's going to then issue a decree, right? So, so in some ways, the enemies of the truth actually help further the, the proclamation of the gospel. Does that make sense? It's similar to those that rise up against it will cause the shaking. Yeah. Or so before we move, what's that? Yeah. So people rise up because because the 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 righteous character, the character of the righteous cause causes anger in the wicked. Yeah, it, and it's not so much the people as it's the rising up that causes the anger, the resistance that causes the shaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's a thin line there, but... Yeah. yeah. Before whom will God's people be privileged to bear witness of their faith in the near future? All who prove their loyalty by obedience to the law of Jehovah must be prepared to be arrested to be brought before councils that have not for their standard the high and holy law of God. 
many will have to stand in the legislative courts. Some will have to stand, have to stand before kings and before the learned of the earth to answer for their faith. The time is not far off when the people of God will be called called upon to give their testimony before the rulers of the earth to answer uh, uh, let me see rulers of the earth not one in 20 has the realization of what rapid strides we are making toward the great crisis in our history now so one of the things you know when it came to July 18th we could see that we definitely weren't prepared to stand before the rulers of the earth to proclaim our testimony Right. One of the main reasons I knew. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. They will have the privilege of bringing the light before those who are called the great men of the earth. And if you have studied the Bible, if you are ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, your enemies will not be able to gainsay your wisdom. Many will be called to speak before councils and in courts of justice, perhaps separately and alone. The experience which would have helped them in this emergency, they have neglected to obtain. And their souls are burdened with remorse for wasted opportunities and neglected privileges. And, you know, I think all of us can say that we've um, wasted opportunity and neglected privileges. But we can now you know, spend time studying God's word, uh, understanding it, and developing a Christ-like character, which is going to be the main thing that's going to be uh, uh, convicting for those who hear us. Will we be tested as groups or as, in, as individuals? The members of the church will individually be tested and proved. They will be placed in circumstances where they will be forced to bear witness for the truth. So one of the things we can say about this is if we are dependent upon the, the pastor or the church uh, to understand the truth, but will that really help us in the time when we are individually to be tested? Will it matter how much my pastor knows or how much I know? Will my pastor's experience be tested or will my experience be tested? Yours. Your experience, I'm sorry. Yeah, individual. Yeah, which which we have to take into account because many of us depend upon the knowledge of others, whether it's their knowledge of God or the knowledge of the truth, you know, in, in, in its details. And we need to study these things for ourselves and we need to present them to others. Uh, there's no better, better way to learn something than to teach somebody else. It does not seem possible to us now that any should have to stand alone. But if God has ever spoken by me, the time will come when we shall be brought before councils and before thousands for his name's sake. And each one will have to give the reason of his faith. Then will come the severest criticism upon every position that has been taken for the truth. You know, so one of the reasons I read lots of anti-Adventist literature, you know, there's there's more than one reason. One is I like reading um, and learning, but um, I recognize that I need to know the arguments that are being brought against the truth. One is because I need to know whether what we believe is the truth or not. Right. So if it's truth, it can be examined. Now, there is many who are just happy with what they believe and have never examined, never determined whether it is true or not. We need then to study the word of God that we may know why we believe the doctrines we advocate. And I would say that very many Adventists have no idea why they believe what they do, in my experience that they could not give a reason for their faith. Of course, does this mean ministers only, or should every church member prepare to be publicly tested? We already addressed that. Many will now stand before legislative courts. Let no one imagine he has no need to study because he is not to preach in the sacred desk. You know not what God may require of you. Are we all now ready to be cross-examined for our faith? Now, what does it mean to be cross-examined? Has anybody ever been in court where you've had to deal with a judge or prosecutor? 
You don't have to answer. That, yeah, right? I've, I've been in court a few times, but I haven't been grilled that much. I usually. Yeah. Well, I know, you know, I've been in court um, dealing kind with of child rude. support and stuff. Frank. And I tell you, <laughs> you think that you you have something to say, uh, but you that judge can easily intimidate you and make you look like a fool if you're not prepared, right? And, I'll tell you uh, a story, you know. Back when, I was, back when I was younger, I used to have I used to have this knife and this gun in my back car in the back seat of my car, and I had my gun uncovered, covered up. Well, police police officer stopped me and and wrote me a ticket and took my took my knife, and I think he took my gun too. I had spent so long, but anyway, it. When, it, when I'm getting around to, I had to go to court. Though. And when I got to court, well, my daddy went with me, but when I got to court, I defended myself. And mm-hmm. I won the case, and I got my knife back. And I think I got my gun back, too. But I was I was afraid because I knew I was going to get <laughs> pounded. <laughs> <laughs> I knew they was going to sock it to me. But... <laughs> The guy, the guy, the, I asked the police officer, I said, well, did you see the, did you see the butt of the gun in it? That's how he knew it was that covered up. The, guy, he, the butt was hanging out of the covers. And he said, yeah, I seen it. He said, and then, then the knife, I told him, didn't I show you the knife? I, he said, ask me if I had anything on my knife. He said, yeah, he was trying to get me because it was covered up or I um, tried to hide it, you know. Oh. And I won the case over that, but if in my day wasn't there, I don't know who won that t- t- case. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, I know I, all I can do. say is that when you're under those types of pressures, the only thing that you really have going for you is the truth. You know, if you if you had to uh, sort of fake it, it would be pretty hard to do. But um, anyway, so being cross examined is not something anybody would want to have happen, but something that, you know, may happen to us for our faith. I've been shown that many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth know, know, what, know not what they believe. But they do not understand the evidences of their faith. They have no just appreciation of the work for the present time. And when the time of trial shall come, there are men now preaching to others who will find, upon examining the positions they hold, that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason. Until thus tested, they knew not their great ignorance. And there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe. But until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. Now, there was a... Uh, an interesting study that was done regarding people's uh, uh, perceived knowledge of what they believed that they knew and understood about and what their actual knowledge base is. And and what they find is that um, that people can watch a video, um, you know, watch something on TV or, or read something and think that because they've read it, and they have a smattering of understanding, maybe of it, that they actually understand it. But when when is it that we what is it that we need in order to have understanding? How do we uh, how would they test whether somebody has understanding or something? They're giving my test, wouldn't they? Okay, be, no tests actually able, aren't very good. To be able to if you explain can teach it. it then yeah. you understand it. To be you see the to difference. Explain it ourselves. Yeah. Because yeah. so sometimes, you know, like we go to school and we take a course and, you know, we answer some multiple choice questions. And, you know, we're going to have learned a little bit. But um, one of the reasons they have people write essays is it's it's a lot different just answering a multiple choice question about did you remember some details that were presented or can you actually explain the concepts and ideas that you were taught and 
in order for a person to understand something, they actually have to study it. They have to study it. They have to present it. They have to write about it. So, so often people have this perception that they know about things that they have never, they've never shared with anyone else, that they've never presented it. Uh, they might have an interest in it and read about it, but they don't really know it. And I would think this that's is... how many Seventh Day Adventists are with Adventism. They, they're acquainted with the ideas, but if they had to present those ideas to someone else, they would be at a, completely at a loss. Yeah, Kelly? Yeah, a couple of illustrations from my plumbing education and training. So you go to school for four years. At the end of four years, there's a Red Seal exam, which qualifies you to work in any province in Canada and actually around the world. Mm -hmm. But it, there's up till then, we answer it's three hour exams for the provincial test each year. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth year, the, there's two tests, the provincial and the Red Seal. And the Red Seal exam is four hours long. And you sit down and you think you're going to just repeat or answer questions to the by the knowledge you've gained. Mm -hmm. But you don't. You, you have to. We have in the Red Seal exam, you have to take that knowledge and then apply it to a problem and solve the problem using the knowledge. But there's no no one answer that we've actually studied. And it's the same thing with truth. It's. It's like we can repeat verses of scripture, uh, concepts, ideas, but can we apply it to our life? And and it's like, it's a very difficult exam. Um, mm -hmm. So bringing it home to scripture is, I've said it so many times, and it's so true, is that we can have wisdom and knowledge, but without understanding it's powerless. Yeah. Well, and I mean, for me, I mean, the, the real benefit I've had um, in church and understanding things has been like being a Sabbath school teacher and doing sermons and doing presentations, you know, because there's one thing to just read some books about things and think about things. But, you know, the Bible studies and having discussions and and having to put ideas together. um and to deal, of course, not just there, but in, even in real life situations where somebody comes to you and, and, you know, wants to know what you believe, wants to know the truth or somebody that uh, maybe attacks what you, you say, right, they, or what you believe. They challenge you. In all of these sorts of experiences, we continue to learn in ways that we couldn't have learned um, before. Right. And so God allows these trials in our lives uh, to test our faith. Right. So we have situations where we have to gain an experience with God. But it's surprising how many people who are Seventh-day Adventists never share what they believe with anyone. And um, that they only really talk amongst Seventh-day Adventists. Right. All of their friends are Seventh-day Adventists. They they believe that they know the truth. Because, you know, they've sat through sermons and they've sat in Sabbath school classes. But we could be very surprised, you know, that when it comes to actually what we believe, it could be easily undone. Right. The it's a little bit. Of, in, what's that? A little bit of a rough term, but like places like Lacombe, Loma Linda and so on, where there's large communities of Adventists. Yeah, the ghettos. This, that was going to say. Adventist ghettos. It's like yeah. it's like they're the only ones there, and there's never any challenge. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, if, we don't know if your whole experience, challenge. yeah, if your whole experience is you just associate with Seventh Day Adventists and you go to church and you go to Adventist schools and universities, um, one is you you're probably going to have a lot of your faith already undermined, right? The foundation isn't going to be there. Amen. And um, and it doesn't mean, you know, just us studying that, you know, somehow we then, you know, we know the truth and we'll be fine because it is putting it into practice in our lives that is is the most important because we have to have a sure confidence, faith, faith in God. Right. 
not just in our in ourselves, in our own knowledge. You know, and, and I said, you know, before in other times, like, you know, I was a pretty studied Seventh-day Adventist before I came into this movement. Um, but this movement has tested, you know, it, it showed me how little I actually understood of Adventism. I mean, I'm not saying I didn't understand anything, but there's so much to learn and know. And, and as we grow in our knowledge, God gives us a greater responsibility as well in, in, you know, in sharing that knowledge. To, to give a little background to the what you're saying there, I remember gets, you know, wait, being uh, woken from my slumber by you just quietly getting up, you're coming up, you come up the stairs and into the study at, four or five a.m. and i'm like what's he doing up so early <laughs> and and you were you were learning but yeah so you were gaining a lot of knowledge and i see what you're saying about the movement here experience and how that knowledge applies yeah and but yeah our knowledge like the more you learn the more you realize how little you know yeah right and, mm-hmm. and our dependence upon god in those times you know, like some people are going to be completely unprepared that is, they've never really had their faith tested in any way. But but even then, you know, it's not it's not just about head knowledge, right? It's about experience. It's about our confidence in God. And as as we grow in our knowledge of the scriptures, our confidence in God also grows. <clears throat> Those who have only a superficial understanding of truth will not be able clearly to expound the scriptures and give definite reasons for their faith. They will become confused and will not be workmen uh, that need not be ashamed. Okay, so that sums up that idea. Okay, what should we be doing now in order to be ready when brought to trial for our faith? I saw that the saints must get a thorough understanding of present truth which they will be obliged to maintain from the scriptures. So um, when we deal with present truth, I mean, what is Ellen White referring to as present truth? We'll take a poke at that. It's uh, present truth is truth that becomes applicable in the present days of our life. Oh, okay. Days, days of the church as well. Yeah. So, so a prophetic understanding of what's happening now. I'm shaking right? my head. I mean, yeah. Yes. Because we kind of throw that that phrase around, present truth. Um, you know, obviously that would be an understanding of the Sabbath and the state of the dead and on all of these these uh, doctrines of Adventism. But these are the things that are going to be challenged, right? Many of many of these these um, you know, there's going to be lots of people, obviously, during the Sunday law that are. They're not going to be challenging whether God exists or not, right? That's not going to be, uh, they're not going to say, well, God doesn't exist. I mean, because they're bringing in the Sunday law. <laughs> but how do we, how do we stand for the Sabbath? How do we just stand for Christ's righteousness and for the prophetic events that are unfolding? Now, the servants of Christ are to prepare no set speech to present when brought to trial for their faith. Their preparation is to be made day by day in treasuring up in their hearts the precious truths of God's word. Right. So when we think about treasuring in in our hearts, that is when we're reading the scriptures, are we are we feeding upon them? Are we seeing that there's something that's precious? Because it's not just an intellectual understanding of the truths of scripture. But it's. It's how they affect us, right? In feeding upon the teachings of Christ and through prayer, strengthening their faith. Then when brought into trial, the Holy Spirit will bring to their remembrance the very truths that will reach the hearts of those who shall come to hear. So when the truth means something to us, when we've had an experience that real, that's real with Christ, you can see how that experience can reach the hearts of others, right? Yes. God will flash the knowledge obtained by diligent searching of the scriptures into their memory at the very time when it is needed. Yeah, Kelly, you have a comment or? 
Uh, I was just agreeing. But also, mm-hmm. yeah, that experience has been mine over and over. Like that. I think I don't know enough to give an answer, but when put on the spot, the hot seats, or even just in a conversation with someone that is pressing a point, and I, I don't, it's like the answers come out. Uh, the scriptures, the Bible just comes to mind, and they get quite frustrated because <laughs> all I'm doing is just saying the Bible. I'm not repeating yeah. my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they I, state, it's not like I've memorized those verses particularly. I just yeah. need the mind. Yeah. Now, um, this next statement from Fifth Testimonies, page 273, right? Message to the Levites. Our people need to understand the oracles of God. They need to have a systematic knowledge of the principles of revealed truth, which will fit them for what is coming upon the earth and prevent them from being carried about by every wind of doctrine. So when we look at a principle, right, these, uh, you know, if you understand how something works, and this would go, Kelly, to what you're talking about, plumbing, right, you can solve a problem that you haven't faced before, right? If you understand the principles of, let's say, how music works, I can extrapolate from those principles how to compose a piece of music or how to analyze a piece of music or how a piece of music works and operates instead of sheer memorization. So this, not everybody can relate to this, but when I took music theory in university, the way that it was taught was we had to remember all these different rules. You know, you when you're writing uh, parts in like a, like a hymn, uh, you, you know, you avoid parallel fifths and parallel octaves and, and there was all these different rules that you had. But the teacher never taught us why these rules existed. That is, the principles underneath them. We knew the what's, but not the why's. And, um, of course, I'm always interested in why. Right? So um, so for me, what I, I would always do is kind of a reverse engineering. I would say, well, here is these rules um, why do those rules exist? And so from that, I could draw the principles of music and harmony and how it functioned. So more from a mathematical or physics uh, perspective, you know, why harmony works the way it does, why we have these rules in music, why certain things sound a certain way. And, um, you know, it, it it's, it's, once you know the principles of how something works, you can figure it out. Um, but some people just memorize. They don't really understand how things work. And, and the way that we learn that in the spiritual realm is through experience of cooperating with God. Like learning of Christ's character. Can you learn of Christ's character by reading a book? Or do you learn of Christ's character by living in the world and dealing with problems and people and 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 examining your own heart. By experience, yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. So so obviously we read the Bible, right? It's important. But we could read the Bible without applying it to our lives. And we wouldn't really be learning of God. That's why Jesus says, Come unto me all ye that labor on a heavy laden, I'll give you rest, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Right? So as we yoke up with Christ. We can learn of his meekness and lowliness. And then here, understanding these principles, these are important to prevent them from being carried about by every wind of doctrine. So I've noticed some things as I've been in discussions on social media, especially regarding uh, anti-Trinitarians. And it, it sort of took me a while to put my finger upon it, what they were actually doing. And I would say, and I don't, I don't know much about the motives of the different individual people. Some people maybe are just influenced by others and just repeating what they've heard. But, um, and this is true, of course, with lots of people who believe error, false doctrine, is that there is this um, avoidance of being nailed down, Right. So, so you can think about flat earthers. Let's, let's use them as an example. 
Do flat earthers ever have a model that explains every observable phenomenon? No. No, right? It's going to change. What they're going to say is going to change based upon whatever argument or point you're talking about, right? No, no flat earther can create a model that can explain why we can determine the, the times that the sun is going to rise and set on every place on earth. You know, they can give this thing, well, you know, the sun is just above the earth and it's, you know, it only shines so far and all that. But if you look at the model, it doesn't actually model what we see in reality or, you know, the fact that, you know, the stars uh, go around in a counterclockwise at the around Polaris, the North Star. And when you're in Australia, they they go clockwise uh, around um uh, the Southern Cross, right? You know, no model, flat Earth model, can explain that. So, um, so there are these types types of problems that uh, um, that if you don't if you don't understand the principles of of how things work, you can be deceived. So, if you know the truth, if you understand the principles of the gospel. I am I'm convinced that you're not going to be led far away from the truth by all these winds of doctrine. There, there's something about false doctrine that has has no connection to the truth. It's not just that the doctrines are wrong, that they're they're wrong in a very fundamental way. Okay. So I don't know quite that, how to explain it. Excuse me. That that explains the 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 phrase or whatever, the ring of truth, when something has the ring of truth mm-hmm. and it re- resonates with all the other truth, it's in harmony with. And when it's not, it doesn't have the ring of truth. It's a discordant note. And, and you can. Yeah. Hear. Yeah. It creates all kinds of contradictions, but contradictions to principles, right? Doesn't naturally. F- so, so. <sighs> You know, what I've often tried to do in, in examining my, my own self, but, but in examining other things that people present, is I want to get down to what are my basic assumptions being made? And how am I defining what, what I, the words that I'm using? There's some other ideas. One thing that's kind of interesting, um, so this is a little bit of an aside, but uh, as, as watching a video on YouTube, this guy brought up this extremely important point, and he was uh, talking about Neil deGrasse Tyson, and um, and he said that his basic arguments are always what we call reductionist. Now, by reductionist, um, uh, let's say you said something like, um, "Well, you know, abortion is okay because they're just a, the the fetus is just a clump of cells." So that would be a reductionist argument. It it puts a, a, are our babies just a clump of cells. No. Okay. Now you could redu- reduce them to that, but aren't you also just a bunch of a clump of cells? In a reductionist world, you are right. You, you understand what I'm saying by this? That we can is, we can say, uh, okay, Kelly, go on. Is a difference though one has the breath of life and the other doesn't. Well, that, I don't think that that's that's the main point there well, because we, babies well, we don't have the breath of life as well. Well, we do all have cells in our bodies, and they all work on principles. Okay, so, but it, that that's not uh, clumped together. I don't think. <laughs> well, I guess, we're all I, I together. Guess, I, babies guess, are so. just as designed as us, and they they receive oxygen just like we do. It's just through their mothers. Oh, that's right. I was going to say, yeah, the amniotic fluid, they're breathing it in their lungs, right? Well, well, the amniotic fluid they breathe in, they don't get oxygen from it, though. They get oxygen through the umbilical cord. Umbilical cord, yeah. But they still are receiving oxygen from their mother. But but that's not the point. It's the reductionist argument. We could argue that we're just clumps of cells, or emotions are just chemical reactions. Does that mean our emotions don't mean anything or have any purpose? You know, you know, if, uh, you know, somebody that you love died and a person said to you, uh, 
you know, well, you know, I know you're sad, but, you know, that's just a chemical reaction that you're experiencing. It's not really important. Does that help? Our emotions I just don't know chemical reactions. It could get you in a fight. <laughs> I don't know. But the point is, our, our emotions, are they chemical reactions? They are, but they're more than that, right? So, so when it comes to, to understanding truth, People can avoid the truth in many, many different ways. And, you know, when we go over back to the Trinitar anti-Trinitarians, they, they make these arguments because they don't understand the principles involved, right? And they're constantly shifting. Their arguments shift depending on what argument you bring against them, right? So plain statements in the spirit of prophecy are completely ignored based upon uh well, equivocation. Equivocation is where you change the meanings of the word in different contexts. Um, so the meaning of a word can have words that have more than one meaning, right? So in different contexts, they have different meanings. So you, you adjust the meaning of the word for one context for the meaning of the word in another context. So, you know, so they argue about what is a person, you know, where Ellen White says the Holy Spirit is a person. You know, they're going to give it a different meaning than they would in, in other situations. Right. So I guess what I'm saying here is that that we need a deeper understanding of the scriptures that is. Is real. It's not just a surface understanding of things, but it's actually a very practical. And principled understanding of scripture, that is, it comes from our experience that. We understand what God's love is. We understand, um, you know, we understand, in a sense, the mind of God. In order to support the truth, we need to know the truth. And Christ, Jesus Christ is the truth. And, and you'd be surprised that knowing Christ, how much knowledge that can give you when you're encountering um, individuals who are searching for truth that they ask a question you have never asked before that you've never been asked and that you from that principle can reveal the truth to them because you're revealing Christ to them. Does that make sense to people? I don't hope that's not too abstract. Well, <clears throat> it makes complete sense. Yeah. It's like when I'm having a discussion with my son, who's an agnostic and I just share mm -hmm. my conversion experience and and how so it was so real for me. And he just says, well, I can't argue with that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the life of a person that, the living witness, that people, they can't argue with it. Mm -hmm. They can see. Yeah, it. We'll, we'll be surprised at how, how our testimony, how our life, the decisions that we've made, how much effect they're going to have in the long run that we don't now presently see. You understand especially, what I'm saying? Especially the bad decisions, poor decisions, yeah. decisions yeah. where we've, you know, chosen the wrong way. And those decisions, the wonderful thing is God is so redemptive. He He takes those decisions, no matter what they are, and turns them into good, a, a blessing for us and for others. It makes us better people if we receive the correction. Right, if we receive the correction. Yeah. Right. When we're corrected from error, it's a powerful testimony to the truth. Okay. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I'd like to welcome my my friend Jacob. Yeah. He's yeah, he's interested in studies, and, mm -hmm. and I think we might see him in the mornings and even well, some, be good. Just mention him and mention him in prayer. Welcome. Yeah. Him, please. Yeah. Well, thank. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. To, I was wondering who Jacob was. But, uh, oh, man. I, I know a few Jacobs, but uh, it's nice to, that you're here. Okay, so um, well, let's close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the truths of Scripture and for the principles of the gospel, uh, the principle of love, of your character, uh, that um, you have demonstrated to us in your mercy and love towards us and that we can demonstrate in mercy and love towards others. We know, Lord, that you want to heal us, 
Um, we pray for each one. Uh, we pray for Jacob and, and Kelly and uh, pray for ourselves, Lord. We know that, that we are damaged because of sin, not just our own sins and sins of others as well. Things have happened to us in our lives that have, have hurt us, have damaged us. And yet your redemption has been shown to us. We just pray, Lord, that we can reveal your character to others, even in the little ways that you give us in those little opportunities. Uh, we pray that you can be with us through the rest of the Sabbath and that you can bring us together again to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.